When George Calvert decided to set up a Catholic haven in the New World, he already had a fair amount of colonization experience. He'd been a member of the Virginia Company, and when it was dissolved, he was named by the king as one of Virginia's royal commissioners. But a few months later, he'd resigned all his public posts, converted to Catholicism, and gone to Ireland. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Then he'd sailed to Newfoundland, where he tried to set up the colony of Avalon, but it was cold and the soil was poor. So two years later, in 1628, he decided to move south. He sailed to Virginia possibly to settle there, but more likely to explore the area and scout out places for his own colony. Even if he intended to stay, though, the authorities required him to sign the notorious Oath of Allegiance. He proposed his own oath, which would demonstrate his unwavering and genuine loyalty to the king without rejecting the pope, but they rejected his proposal and forced Baltimore and his colonists to return to England. On the way home, though, Baltimore explored around the Chesapeake, and he decided to found his colony there. He returned home and started drafting a charter. His proposed charter was a unique one. It essentially created a feudal palatinate, the most independent way a colony could possibly be organized. Baltimore and his heirs and assigns would be the Lord's proprietary, with essentially total control over the colony. He'd have a legislature to advise and assent to his laws, but little required legislative or judicial input and there would be virtually no oversight from England. The Lord Proprietor couldn't, however, pass laws which would deprive people of life or property without legislative input. Churches would be consecrated according to the ecclesiastical laws of England, but the issue of the state church would be left to the colonists. The Lord Proprietor could confer dignities and titles raise and maintain a military force and wage war, he could also constitute manors and establish courts barren, which was key to his recruitment of the colonists. He could proclaim martial law, impose taxes, and England could not tax the colony without its consent, except for customs duties. And not only would Baltimore's colony not be considered a part of Virginia, if there was any ambiguity in the wording of the charter, it would always be interpreted in Baltimore's favor. The colony would exist to serve the king, though, and as such, all of the king's subjects would be allowed to catch, salt, and dry fish in Baltimore's colony, and they could cut any wood that they needed for this purpose. The king would get a fifth of any gold and silver found in the province, and Baltimore would send the king a yearly tribute of two Indian arrows every Easter week. This was a very unique charter, but King Charles supported Baltimore's claim. Baltimore was trusted, loyal, and was operating under an ideology that the king fundamentally agreed with. And Virginia was a crown colony, under his control, so he felt at liberty to give a portion of it to Baltimore. But this is where the issue enters a little bit of a gray area. Or, more accurately, a massive gray area which would have consequences which plagued both Maryland and Virginia for years. In the eyes of Virginia, though they were a crown colony, They were still a colony with jurisdiction and authority over the area of the original 1607 charter. 
The only thing that had changed was that the London Company was gone. They still had their local legislature, and the local government still had its own rights and jurisdiction. They didn't want the king to cut off a piece of their land and give it to somebody else, especially Catholics. So Virginia immediately began to work to assert its dominance over the region. Governor John Pott and council members Samuel Matthews, Roger Smith, and William Claiborne wrote a petition to the king in 1629 asking for a confirmation of their rights and the protection of their religion. And soon afterward, Claiborne went to England personally to demand that Baltimore not be given a land grant south of the James River. And he did stop the confirmation of that grant. And while he was in England, Claiborne entered an agreement with a London merchant firm called Clobbery and Company, which made him their agent, the man who would trade for furs for their company in the region north of Virginia. He then got a license from the king to trade with Nova Scotia, and then he returned to Virginia, where he got a license from the Virginia governor to trade with the Dutch and New England. Claiborne then bought some land from the Indians at what's now Kent Island in Maryland, set up some buildings, stationed some men, and set up a plantation and trading post. The patent, which was issued about 10 months later, though, was for the land north of the Virginia settlements. And you can see where this is going. And in addition, George Calvert died right before the charter passed the seal. So instead, the charter was given to his oldest son and heir, the 27-year-old Cecil Calvert, the new Lord Baltimore. But... Cecil shared his father's vision, and charter in hand, the new Lord Baltimore started recruiting people for the mission. The setup again was semi-feudal. People were assigned land based on how many other people they brought with them, including wives, children, and servants, and they had to pay the Lord Proprietor a yearly quit-rent based on how much land they got. That land would become a manor, with all the royalties and privileges given to manors in England, but every servant or family member they brought along needed to be adequately supplied with a list of provisions that Baltimore had recommended, and the cost of these provisions came to about £20 per person. Still, it was a pretty good deal for people. Some of the gentlemen who signed up were Baltimore's own friends, even Protestant ones. Their religion would be accepted in Maryland, and the prospect of getting a manor was appealing, especially for younger sons. Some of the Catholics were recruited from Henrietta Maria's court, but for the vast majority of recruitment, Baltimore relied on the Jesuit priest that he had employed, the man who became known as the Apostle of Maryland, Father Andrew White. White had been born in London in 1579 and had studied in the English exile colleges at Douay and Valladolid. He'd returned to England after graduating, but been arrested in 1603, and then he'd become a Jesuit. He'd gone back into exile, periodically sneaking back into England to visit Catholic friends, and when Cecil Calvert had offered him a job, he'd moved back to England permanently. When the idea of Maryland came up, he was perfect for recruiting people because he had connections with other Catholic priests and families, and he was personally dedicated to the idea of converting the Native Americans to Christianity. He recruited another Jesuit named John Altam to join him in Maryland, and then he went about helping his employer to organize the mission. So there were two types of people going to Maryland. There were the affluent passengers, 
who were almost exclusively gentlemen, a lot of whom came from old and well-known Catholic families, people like Thomas Cornwallis and Jerome Hawley, who had married into the family of the Earl of Devon. And perhaps most interestingly of all, three of the gentlemen passengers were Edward, Frederick, and Robert Winter, nephews of the gunpowder plot conspirators. But as we're talking about gentlemen, I'd actually like to directly address something that I only touched on in the Jamestown episodes, and that I sort of regret not having discussed more directly, and that is the misconception of the 17th century English gentleman as a dandy. Gentlemen of the 17th century may have been less warlike than those before Henry VII in the Wars of the Roses, but they were still at least somewhat tough and not completely averse to hard work. They joined the military, they staged uprisings and rebellions under just about every monarch since Henry VII, and in just a few years they would take sides and in many cases leadership positions in the English Civil War. The perception of the English gentleman as a useless dandy isn't really applicable until the 18th century, and that was actually a big part of the cultural split which ultimately helped fuel the American Revolution in colonies which hadn't previously been particularly revolution-minded. That's obviously years down the line in our discussion, but it's important to note as we envision the gentlemen who ended up in places like Jamestown and Maryland. But back on topic, while the majority of gentlemen were Catholics, the vast majority of the servants were Protestants. And because there were more servants than gentlemen on the mission, there were overall more Protestants than Catholics who moved to Maryland. But again, the split wasn't 100%. And in fact, one of the most dramatic stories of the voyage to Maryland involves a Catholic servant who, while preparing to go to Maryland, was confronted and pushed to sign the Oath of Allegiance. When he refused, he ended up in the hands of a merchant who was preparing to send him as an involuntary indentured servant to some other colony. Only at the last minute did one of the Catholic gentlemen recognize the servant, pay the merchant for him, and take him as a companion to Maryland. All in all, about 200 people planned to make the trip, and even more gave money and servants for the mission. Baltimore then hired a 400-ton merchant ship called the Ark and a 40-ton pinnace called the Dove to transport his people and supplies to America. He had intended to accompany the mission himself, but with ongoing legal disputes with Virginia, he decided to remain in England for a year and appointed his younger brother, Leonard Calvert, to act on his behalf as governor. And because he couldn't go personally, he sent his colonists with a set of clear instructions. And these instructions really illustrate his unique approach to founding Maryland, as well as the unique difficulties of founding a Catholic colony in North America. His orders detailed that the colonists must be extremely careful, they must be extremely deferential, they must be extremely fair, all without being weak. He forbade religious disputes, particularly Catholics offending Protestants, and he required the Catholics to treat all Protestants fairly, even more than fairly. He required people to take an oath of loyalty to the king as a condition of settling there. He ordered the colonists to try to learn more about his adversaries as well as the political situation in Virginia and why Virginia was as hostile as it was to the colony, but he also ordered the colonists to be extremely cautious about going to Jamestown or near the fort at Point Comfort. Instead, he instructed the colonists to settle Maryland first, 
and then to send a Protestant messenger to Jamestown to notify the Virginia governor of their arrival, of their charter, and to assure him that Baltimore wanted good relations with Virginia and that he intended to come, but he needed to stay in England for an extra year. Baltimore ordered the colonists to make every effort to oblige the Council of Virginia, but to make it clear that their behavior was a matter of courtesy and not Maryland giving up her rights. Most of all, though, Baltimore said that they just shouldn't have anything to do with Virginia in the first year, just to be on the safe side as legal disputes were settled. He gave them similar orders regarding Captain Claiborne, saying that once they settled, they should tell him about their arrival and their authority, and to invite him to a friendly meeting. Again, the person who carried the message should be a Protestant, and if he agreed to meet, they should be extremely courteous and tell him that not only were they dedicated to preserving his rights, Baltimore had already demonstrated that dedication in England by rejecting an agreement with Clobbery and Company, which would have made slight of Claiborne's interest. They were to make it clear that Baltimore intended to do Claiborne no wrong, but to show him all the love and favor that they could. And again, if Claiborne refused to meet with them, the colonists were simply to leave him alone for the first year, provoking no conflict until Baltimore could either come to Maryland or give them further directions. And in the case of both Claiborne and Virginia as a whole, they should spend the first year quietly learning more about the situation. Baltimore ordered them to find two settlement locations, one for a fort and one for a permanent town, and said their first priority in establishing the town should be to put it in a healthy, fertile place. The second priority should be that it could be easily fortified. And third, it should be in a place which would be convenient for trade with both English and Indians. As soon as they chose a place, they should bring the men ashore with all the provisions, assemble everyone, and read Baltimore's letters to them, as well as explaining the general plan of the colony and the priorities of the colony, which were first, to convert the Indians to Christianity, second, to augment the king's empire, and third, working to advance the interests of the colony and its investors. The first things that they should build should be a fort, a storehouse, and a church, and the colonists should build their houses in as decent and uniform a way as they could. The surveyor should survey everything and plan it out, and after setting up and organizing the settlement, they should send Baltimore plats of everything, as well as reports about everything, and when in doubt, they should send him information multiple times rather than not at all. Finally, Baltimore ordered that corn and food be planted every year before anything else, and only when there was enough corn planted should people begin planting things like tobacco. All men should be given military training and regular drilling, and they should look for places to make salt and saltpeter as well as searching for iron ore and other commodities. So this was a very reasonable, practical, and intelligent set of instructions. It told the colonists what they needed to prioritize and what they really didn't need to pick fights over. And it tried to anticipate problems before they happened. If Baltimore couldn't join them, he would do the next best thing, and it really sounds like he did the next best thing. So finally, passengers on board, orders in hand, on November 22nd, 1633, 
the Ark and Dove set sail from the Isle of Wight. And it was a rough, rough beginning. First, they almost got caught by Turkish pirates, only to be saved by a London merchant ship called the Dragon. Then a violent storm hit as the three ships were sailing together. The Ark was big enough to withstand the storm, and the Dragon turned back for England. The Dove, though, was in real danger. They decided to push on, telling the officers of the Ark that they'd hang a light from their masthead if they were in danger of sinking. The storm got more and more violent, though, and in the middle of the night, the Ark's crew could see two lights displayed from the Dove's masthead, which quickly disappeared. Then, for three days, the Ark was battered by the storm. Its mainsail split, its rudder unshipped, completely alone and totally at the mercy of the waves until the storm died down or they sank. As the latter began to look more and more likely, they prayed and gave penance, but finally the storm started to dissipate. The rest of the voyage was relatively calm. Though 12 people did die after drinking Christmas wine, the Ark encountered another fleet of ships that they feared were pirates, but their course luckily steered them toward land before the ships could approach. They stopped at a few islands to trade, buy, and sell goods to help Baltimore recoup part of the expedition's expenses. And they finally ended up in Barbados, where the local merchants were oddly hostile, demanding exorbitant prices for the provisions they wanted to buy. Their reception may have been in part because they were Catholics. Barbados was an extremely divided island, with a substantial Puritan population, but also enough of a pro-king and pro-high church faction that the brother of Maryland settler Jerome Hawley had actually been governor there. The more important explanation of their cool reception, though, was that Barbados had just discovered a planned servant rebellion the day before. Two West Country brothers named Weston had gathered a group of servants who planned to kill their masters and seize the first ship which touched land and the plot had only been discovered at the last minute when one servant warned them. The Ark would have been that first ship to touch land. With so many narrow escapes, the settlers were feeling pretty good, and they were about to get even more good news, because six weeks after the storm, they reconnected with the Dove, which they had thought had sunk. The Dove had given up trying to fight the storm, changed its course, and taken refuge in the Plymouth Harbor, and then was accompanied by the Dragon to the Bay of Biscay. From there, the Dove had sailed as fast as it could to the Caribbean, finally catching the Ark there. After reuniting, the two ships island hopped around the Caribbean for a little while longer, They spent some time at Montserrat, which was inhabited by Catholic Irish who had been driven from Virginia. They were entertained at St. Christopher's by the English governor and two Catholic captains there, as well as the governor of the French colony on the same island. They ate delicacies like plantains, pineapples, cinnamon, guava, and papayas, and traded with the locals in St. Lucia, who were only willing to trade with them once they saw that they were English. And in February, the Marylanders left, and on February 24th, they finally reached the Chesapeake. Specifically, they reached Point Comfort in Virginia and went directly to Jamestown to meet the Virginia governor, which was contrary to their instructions. Fortunately for them, though, Virginia had recently elected an extremely royalist governor. We'll go back and get into what's been going on in Virginia since it became a royal colony, but suffice it to say for now that Virginia had split into factions every bit as much as England had, 
and that the issue of Maryland had seriously inflamed pre-existing political controversies in the colony. Friendships were ended if one person expressed sympathy for the Marylanders, and in conversations, colonists would say things like, they'd rather just kill their cattle than sell them to the papists. Marylanders weren't just Catholics, they were Catholics encroaching on land that Virginia had always owned. The old governor and the majority of the Virginia council were hostile to the king, but the new governor was John Harvey. He was a strong supporter of the king, and in fact, he was either a brother or a cousin of the famous royalist Dr. William Harvey, who discovered the circulatory system and equated the heart's role in the body to the king's role in a commonwealth. Governor Harvey was also a pragmatist. The colonists brought the king's letters and Baltimore's papers, so clearly the colony was going to be established whether he liked it or not. Plus, the crown owed him quite a bit of money for his duties as a governor, and if Baltimore were an ally, he could push the king for payment. So Harvey quickly began to support the colony, but lending tangible support to the colony was easier said than done. The governor of Virginia was both poorer and less powerful than the council members, and the council members were extremely opposed to both Harvey's politics and his policy toward Maryland. So Harvey didn't have all that much influence, but he did give the Marylanders a warm reception, and they stayed with him for eight to nine days. He sold them some of his own cattle and helped them buy a pinnace, and he also sent another royalist Virginian named Henry Fleet to accompany them as a translator. Fleet had been in Virginia since 1621, but had been taken prisoner by a Maryland area tribe called the Nokochtanks while trading with the Massawomics in 1623. He'd spent five years as a prisoner before the Virginia government paid his ransom, but he learned their language and used this to become a successful trader. And in fact, he was Claiborne's biggest trading rival. So the colonists' meeting with the governor was very, very cordial, and finally they started to sail up to the mouth of the Potomac. There, they saw hundreds of armed natives prepared to resist their landing, as well as alarm fires kindled throughout the country to assemble the tribes and messengers carrying the news of their arrival to the interior. They managed to convince the natives that they had only peaceful intentions, and they bought a piece of land to use for a fort. It was strategically located, but too small for a full settlement, and it was full of berries, nuts, and edible greens. And it was at this place, on March 25th, 1634, that White conducted the first mass in English America. The colonists took communion, and after the Mass, the settlers formed a procession led by the governor, secretary, and other officers, who carried a huge cross on their shoulders and erected it on the island, where they knelt as White recited the Litany of the Holy Cross. They had reached America. And though we'll get into the actual events of settling the colony next week, a letter by Robert Winter, written in 1635, perfectly summarizes the colonists' hopes at this time. Winter said that they had had issues with Virginia, but they were being as obliging as possible, and that he believed that the two colonies would surely put aside their differences and enjoy a happy alliance. The natives were nice, and because the colonists' only ambition was to convert them, there would be no cause for future conflict. The land was good, and Though there was some illness and a temporary lack of necessities, 
It was a perfect place to build a settlement. And as for riches, what more did one need on earth than a decent, comfortable life? Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to firsthand accounts and things. See you next week.